Hello, and thank you for joining our web panel. My name is Shigato Das, Director of Partnering for Bio. I'd like to welcome you to Getting Real with Biotech Valuation. This web panel will help you understand the models to assign value to biotech companies, which are usually unique in their risk profiles. If you are a biotech in clinical development or the late stages of preclinical development, there is no better place to meet investors than the Bio CEO and Investor Conference in New York City at the Waldorf Astoria, February 9th and 10th. If you are a portfolio manager, biotech or healthcare investor or analyst, or a generalist investor or analyst interested in biotech and healthcare, you can attend for free and meet the most promising young therapeutic, diagnostic technology, and platform companies seeking investment in the biopharma industry. Are you looking for in-licensing opportunities? Take advantage of this large gathering of promising biotech companies to kick off or catch up on potential deals. Among program highlights like fireside chats with the CEO of Pfizer and the president of Gilead, the Bio CEO and Investor Conference gives you the opportunity to schedule 30-minute, private, face-to-face -face meetings with conference attendees. We call this partnering. Take advantage of partnering to meet more companies and investors in one event than you may meet in the rest of the year. For those of you who already signed up for the conference, remember to use the partnering system aggressively to secure the most meetings possible by logging in, filling out your profile, sending tailored requests where you really reflect what you want in the subject of your meeting request, checking for new investors and companies often, and following up on cancellations and declines. Remember, it's a week before the conference now, so get busy with the partnering system. So basically, biotech valuation. So valuation is actually a key in the development of biotech companies. Um, we, t we work with a lot of private biotech companies, and one of the things what's key for them is actually that they are able to increase the value in the long in the long run. Um, so valuation is, is key for them to raise money, um, to provide a return to their investors, and to be successful in the long run. Valuation has to increase. So on the other side, um, it's a difficult task. Um, transparency, especially among private companies, it's, it's very limited, it's very difficult to know how much was paid for a company, how much was um, for, for a transaction. Um, and it's very difficult. We have very high uncertainties and we come to that, but we are talking about uh, an investment horizon of, of 10 years. Um, so it, it takes a long time, it's, it's, it's high risk, but it's also high potential. So making investments in biotech, um, there's potential for very high returns for the investors. Um, there's long investment cycles, as I mentioned. Uh, developing a drug takes a long time, so that also impacts um, the investment cycle. So um, it, it is a long, a long time. Um, and then, as I mentioned at the beginning, traditional valuation methods, you, they're not really suited to, to evaluate biotech. So we have to look at alternatives, how to value these, uh, these companies. Okay, to the next slide. So some of the trends, um, I mean, people active in the life science industry, they know, um, you know how it works between the biotech and the pharma. Pharma companies, they have a gap in their pipeline. Um, products run out of patents, so they have, pharma companies need to have new products. And the biotechs are actually the, 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 the supplier of these new products, uh, the innovative new products um, that will bring, hopefully, um, revenues uh, to the pharma companies and help them to grow. Uh, so it's it's the, the 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 model between biotech and pharma, where biotech license out their products to to big pharma. That's actually the, the main one of the main models in in this industry, and it drives the industry as well. And obviously, their valuation is very very important. Uh, when a biotech takes on a pharma takes on the product of a biotech, um, so the licensing. Um, but the other way is also the M and A um, that big pharma is actually buying biotech companies. The third um, possibility for, for biotechs is, is doing an IPO, um, doing a listing, getting money themselves and bringing the product to the market themselves. And we have seen, I think, over 100 listings last year in the US, um, so this is definitely something that's happening at the moment. Uh, what we also see at the end is, is pharma companies competing with investors. We have on one side venture capital investors who will take the risk, who, who um, provide equity to companies to develop their products. On the other side, pharma companies are interested, interested in, in buying these products. So there's a certain competition, and obviously that helps valuation and helps uh, the companies. Good. Next slide. 
So the, the drug development proce process, that's actually an important part of, of also doing valuation. So we have from, from discovery preclinical um, going into the, the clinic where actually the drugs are tested in humans at phase one, phase two, and phase three. So these are pretty standard um, development, uh, development paths um, that a drug has to go through. And this path and this standardization we can actually use in, in doing valuation. So their uh, historical success rate, what is the success rate from moving a product from phase one to phase two? So this is about 66%, so a success rate of 66%, which means uh, a 34% um, um, rate uh, of, of failure, actually. So, and if you look at the whole, um, the whole uh, process, there's about an 11% average percentage um, that a, a company or, pro sorry, a product moves all the way to the market. So actually one in 10 compounds will make it to the market. But this is something that we can actually uh, we can actually use in um, in valuation these statistics. Good. Next slide. I was just going to say something on on there. Sorry, just to jump in. Yeah. Um, no problem. The numbers on the screen are actually based on the end of 2013. These are the most recent numbers. Uh, we published a study last year. You can see at the bottom of the screen in January 2014 in Nature Biotechnology. And those numbers included 2003 to 2011, over 7,300 drug programs. And the numbers on the screen here I gave to Patrick uh, because we, we have updated numbers uh, from our study. So I just wanted to, to point that out. And it's a, a very detailed article in terms of how these probabilities are different between therapeutic areas if you want to go and uh, download that. OK, so now next slide. So obviously very important data for doing valuation. So one of the questions we get asked when we do valuation is um, people tell us, especially companies, private companies, they say, well, Investi will tell us how much you are worth. Why do we need to do evaluation? And I think it's, it's very important to understand there's price and there's value. So there's two different things. Price at the end of the day is supply and demand. What the stock market does every day from today to tomorrow, um, you know, this is the, this is the price moving. Um, the valuation is more that's a long-term um, view, how, how the share price can develop. So doing valuation for publicly listed companies, um, you do that to see where the long-term trend would be for, for the share price. Um, for private companies, obviously, we do that um, to make investment decisions and to have a basis for negotiation to set the price when you talk to investors. So at the end of the day, valuation is, is very important, and um, price and value are two different things. Okay, next slide. So another important factor when doing valuation is at the end of the day, it all comes down to the fundamentals. It comes down to the assumptions. Um, when we do valuation, um, we do an assessment of companies. It's actually the slide before, but um, we do an assessment of company. We look at the management, we look at the market, and we look at the technology. Um, this is very important. At the end of the day, you can um, do whatever valuation you want if you know where to twist. So um, all the calculation you do, you know, that's all fine, but the calculation is not the rocket science. The, the important part of any valuation is actually the assumptions you take. So um, that, that's an important part. Patrick, which slide are you on now? Now we come to this slide, so, so you're good. Yeah. Um, okay. So at the end of the day, Beside the assumptions, you have actually then different valuation models, different valuation approaches. And at the end of the day, there is no right um, approach. There's no um, uh, the magic formula. Unfortunately, um, if it would be, it would be a much easier task. But there are actually different approaches, different um, methods that are being used. Um, discount the cash flow, risk adjusted net present value, or RMPV. Uh, real options, and we come back to that later. Vladimir will talk about that. So these are more operational-based methods. Um, we have, on the other side, more market-based methods, so market comparable or um, comparable transactions. And then there's also something like a, a venture capital method. But the key here is there's no right method, and at the end of the day, it's a combination of different approaches because each has advantages and disadvantages. Okay, next slide. So if we talk about the comparable methods, so 
basically we all know that from uh, price earning, PE ratios for example, it's a classical comparable method. Uh, one of the problems with most biotechs is that we can't use PE, there is no earnings. I think 80% of, of uh, publicly listed biotech companies don't have earnings. So you can't apply PE ratios, you can't uh, use enterprise value um, EBITDR or um, enterprise value sales. So these ratios that we are traditionally used to, uh, to value companies, they don't work with biotech companies. However, you can still use market comparable method, but you have to use different, different ratios. So when we do valuation, adventure valuation, um, we uh, go back and look at other ratios that we use. For example, we use um, uh, R&D expenditures. We look at number of employees. We look at how much money has been raised. Or we look at the product in development in the different phases. But at the end of the day, it's really, um, you have to make sure that you compare two companies which are alike. And that's always difficult to find. So the peer groups have to really, um, they should match each other's business model, their approach. Um, so that's very key when you look uh, when you use comparables. Okay, next slide. So the venture capital method, actually that's a very interesting method, especially, well, mainly for private companies. So this is the thinking of investors. And for investors, what's key before they make the investment is actually to see what could be an exit price because that's where they're going to get the money um, back. That's where they're going to make the return. So the exit is very important for, for investors, especially venture capital investors. So what the venture capitalism investor look at is what exit price could they get. And they do that with comparables. Um, they do that uh, with their um, experience and see, okay, a phase two product uh, company, what would be the value? What would be an exit value? And then from there, they calculate back to the present value to see what are they able to pay today to achieve a certain return over the holding period. And you can see <clears throat> some of the discount rates or some of the multiples that um, investors are looking for. And you can see that's a, a multiple of 20 over a five year period. So a discount rate of between uh, 70 and 90% for very, very early stage biotech companies. If you go down uh, preclinical, um, we're talking about a, a, a ratio, a multiple of, of 10x, um, and obviously the closer a, a company gets to the market, um, the lower the expected returns and, and multiples, but the lower the risk, uh, and that's how it works together. Okay, next slide. So if we do a valuation, we, we can do RMPV, risk adjusted net present value. So this is a little bit different from the MPV, the, the discounted cash flow or net present value. So we, we actually use this success rate that I showed before um, for, this, that for the development stage of the different product. Um, so this is an additional factor, a risk factor that we can use and it makes it helps us actually to, def to define this big risk of biotech companies and puts it into different, um, into two different um, components. The, the product specific development risk and then we have the discount risk. If we do the valuation here, so we look at the development phase, we look at the cost of development, we look at the market phase, uh, we look at what, what revenue potential does this drug have. Um, now, what we also do is normally we, we, we map the, the market phase until the end of the patent. Uh, because after the patent we would expect a, a generic competition to come in and, and really reduce the revenues of that particular drug. Um, so often we don't use a terminal value. We, we may use until patent expiry, possibly two, three years beyond that, but then that's it. We don't go um, and, and use a terminal value most of the time. Okay, next slide. So if you look at an example for an RMPV calculation, so let's say we have a phase one single product company with a discount rate of about 20% and the probability of success of 11%. Uh, the, Dave, uh, the, the figures that we actually have from, from, from the paper that Dave mentioned. Um, so 11%, that means 11% probability from phase one to bring it all the way to the market. So if we do it, the calculation for this specific um, example, we get cash flows of about $2.2 billion for the lifetime of that product. Now, if you look at the discounted cash flow um, with these 20% discount rate, our, our value 
is reduced to about $127 million. So that's one thing. This is just doing the discounting. Now if you introduce the probability and we use the RMPV, you can see in the graph on the right side, um, our, uh, our cash flows are reduced from the $127 million to actually only $8 million. So the RMPV value of this specific product uh, would be only $8 million. So you can see from the 2.2 billion cash flows, we, go, we reduce it to 8, 8 million. And this is really the, the risk, the discounting risk or the discount factor, but most, most of it is also the, the probability of success. Okay, next slide. So now when we do our, the, our RMPV calculation, what, what happens actually now with the, with the value of companies that we have these steps. So every time a company successfully passes a, a, a clinical phase, say we pass clinical phase one, so we eliminate this risk so that the value immediately jumps. Um, and you can see, I use the same example, we start with 8 million. Um, if we pass phase one successfully, we get actually to 18 million. Just successfully passing this, this, uh, this phase. If you can successfully pass phase two, uh, the value actually jumps to 125 million and, and so on. If we go all the way to the market, the value gets to about 672 million. And this is just with the discount, uh, the, the success rate, um, passing these uh, clinical trials successfully. And you actually can see that also if you look at the stock market, um, if a company actually uh, announces a su successful clinical trial, you see exactly these, uh, these impact that the, the stock will jump, the shares will jump, or if, if the trial was not successful, it will go the other way. Okay, next slide. Now, beside the risk adjustment, we have the discount rate. Also here, that has a big impact. Um, and often the question is, so what kind of discount rate do we use? Um, I showed you early in the venture capital method, we use uh, high discount rates. Uh, but this is only if there's no risk adjustment. If we use a risk adjustment, we, only, we already use part of the risk in this risk adjustment. So obviously, our discount rate is, will be smaller. So what, what is typically used, you could say in earlier stage companies, uh, we can use discount rates somewhere between 12 and 28 percent. Um, if you look at later stage companies, it's somewhere 9 to 20 percent uh, of discount rates or cost of equity that we use. Um, if you look at the example again, with the 20 percent discount rate, we had the 8 million. Now, if we already increase it to 25 uh, percent, our value actually drops down to 2 million. Um, if we reduce the discount rate to 15%, the value jumps up to 21 million. So you can see here also the um, this discount rate has quite a big impact also on the value. Now one of the things when we ha talk about discount rate, um, uh, often people ask, well, do I use a VAC or I have heard this VAC, weighted average cost of capital. Now most of the biotech companies that we evaluate, um, they don't have any debt, so debt financing is basically zero, so the discount rate or the cost of equity, that's 100%. So that's what we use. Um, now, the other thing, the other impact factor is also when you look at big pharma companies, because they have quite a high no amount of debt, that they can refinance themselves relatively cheaply through, through debt um, at very low interest rates. Their cost of capital or their weighted average cost of capital actually goes down. So basically, a big pharma company is able to pay a higher price because they have lower costs of capital um, than a biotech because biotech states all equity. So that often helps to find a, a price between a biotech and a pharma because there are different costs of, of capital. Okay, next slide. Actually, my final slide, um, just to kind of do a wrap-up. Before, before you get to the conclusion, could you just say, um, which is more sensitive and causes more drastic changes for your models, the discount rate or the probabilities that you're using for success? Um, it's the probability of success who has um, a, a higher impact, actually. 
Um, and as, as you mentioned before, you know, at the end we look at different discount, uh, different uh, attrition rates for different indications. So that's act actually our starting point. But then from there you even have to look at the specific drug and, and there might be a reason why you would have higher or lower um, uh, rate of success, uh, higher or lower than average. But that means that you, you really have to look at the drug, you have to talk to the scientists, and so that comes back to actually, it's all about the assumptions that you take. But definitely the, the attrition rate. So in terms of uh, the conclusion, um, valuation is a key issue for biotech companies. Um, biotech companies have to be able to increase their value over the long term to be successful. Um, doing down rounds, having lower values um, in the future than you had in the past is not very healthy and often um, uh, kills companies. Um, traditional methods are not really suited for biotech companies. So PE ratios, um, uh, asset valuation, all these things you, you can't use. Um, value is, is really, it's the, the future risk and the future potential. So I always say when we do valuation, we have to look into the crystal ball. So uh, it is looking into the future. It doesn't matter how much a company has spent in the past. It is what, they're, what are they going to do in the future with their IP, with the technology, um, with the people they have, uh, with the product. So it's really looking into the future. It's not an ex exact science. You can do all the calculation you want. It doesn't get more precise. Uh, at the end of the day, you, have to, you get ranges, value ranges. Um, and uh, people say it's, it's an art more than a science. And some people even say it's a black art. And at the end of the day, it's all about assumptions. So I think that's, that's really the key message. It's the assumptions, it's not the model. OK, with that, I, I'm done That's with my great. part. We do, we do have one, I'll take one question, and then we're going to turn it over to Vladimir, um, and then take all the other questions at the end. Uh, but the question was, should you be mixing um, and playing with the discounted rates and the probability of success in a, in a model at the same time? Um, or do you just pick one, hold it constant, and then manipulate the, um, you know, the scenario analysis around the probabilities? Or are you doing both at the same time? We normally do the, um, the uh, attrition rate. We keep that fixed. We have a discussion. We fix the attrition rate. Um, and then we, we use different discount rates. Uh, and that also provides us a range. Excellent. OK. Um, any other questions we're going to take at the, at the end after uh, Vladimir tells us about real options? Um, contact information on the slide. and. Uh, we should be able to email the slides out to the participants today. Um, and this is contact information for venture valuation here. Um, moving on to Vladimir and the real options. Let me, we only have one camera, unfortunately, so I have to. This way here? That's perfect. Just move this chair over here. Okay. Wow. Well, that was a smooth transition. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for taking the time to attend uh, our seminar. Uh, I'll just close this thing here. Uh, actually, yeah. Just, don't just, just hit the, this one here. Right. right. I, I, uh, I so, uh, it's nine minutes. Yeah. yeah. Good. Sorry, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of jazz musician. We're jamming a little bit today. Uh, well, this is, uh, uh, let's keep the, uh, enough about me slide. Um, and uh, uh, basically, Patrick uh, painted for us uh, the landscape of uh, all the different evaluation methodologies and how, uh, you know, a lot of the conventions around using them. I'll focus more around the context uh, in which those methodologies are used and then uh, obviously talk more specifically about one of them uh, called real options. So uh, let's start with uh, the, the context uh, uh, as we, uh, uh, you know, by what people do valuation for different reasons. Some companies do internal valuation for assessing their R&D portfolios. What we are talking today is basically transaction-focused valuation. So valuation that uh, serving the negotiation between two sides about potential investment or purchase or licensing agreement of, of a biotech asset and the fundamental uh, uh, idea of this negotiation is for each side to maximize its leverage and to extract maximum value from 
from the negotiation process. So a key element of building this leverage is a very good understanding of what the deal is worth to each of the parties participating in the negotiation process. And the challenge for each side and, uh, is to develop a full and credible valuation that incorporates the characteristic of the asset, including its high level of uncertainty, uh, and the full potential of value for the party that intends to acquire it, and then use this as a negotiation leverage. Uh, you see here a little uh, Venn diagram that combines the value potential with the uh, value uncertainty, then the specific structure of the deal, and how all those combine into uh, valuation leverage in the negotiation process. Uh, I'll repeat uh, a little bit of the stuff that was said already. Uh, basically, uh, latest study, uh, this one by Tufts University shows that the timeline for getting approvals uh, in biotech gets only longer and longer and the success rate unfortunately is getting lower and lower as a result investing in, in biotech drug development remains a very high risk, very high cost proposition and uh, that's just uh, the nature of the beast today. So why people do it? Well, obviously, uh, you know, investors uh, do it and company buy, uh, you know, uh, R&D development, uh, biotech uh, molecules and companies because of their market potential. And uh, what also remains true, of course, is that this market potential also is quite uncertain and there are multiple factors that impact, uh, can impact it and can influence the final profitability of the drug, even if successful. And here we've outlined uh, some of the most obvious ones, likelihood of approval in key markets, available and forthcoming alternative treatments, comparative efficacy and toxicity, uh, initial pricing, price evolution, uh, reimbursement levels, uh, market penetration and achieve market share, additional indication potential, long-term side effects and potential, you know, later restrictions. Uh, potential for patent extension and you know uh, cost of manufacturing and distribution. So uh, the, the industry is characterized by high uncertainty both in its development R&D investigation state and in its uh, market life uh, of the drugs when they successfully get developed and approved. So uh, what is then uh, the challenge of the evaluation? The challenge of the evaluation, whatever the state of the drug is, to uh, reflect to the best possible way all possible sources of value that are incorporated in the strategic plan of a potential acquirer or investor in this asset. And uh, here, there are four major groups uh, of sources of value. Uh, the most fundamental one is the intrinsic value. So what is the standalone market potential incorporating the R&D risk and the market risk of, of the asset? Uh, a second very important source is to this particular acquirer, what are the synergies that the asset brings? Is there a fit with the existing R&D portfolio or existing drug portfolio? Do the R&D capabilities of the acquirer provide a leverage in a successfully completing the development stage and getting approval and do the manufacturing and marketing capabilities of the acquirer uh, provide additional leverage and synergies in uh, reaching markets, achieving market share, achieving higher reimbursement. So very important second source of value. A third source is, uh, you know, a strategic and as you can see in every one of those uh, categories we put value and uncertainty because each one of those come with high level of uncertainty that we already discussed. The next one is strategic value and uncertainty. So uh, if if this drug development is successful, if market penetration is successful, what additional opportunity this success would create for the potential acquirer for even uh, you know, similar developments or, uh, or entering this market with existing drugs or other potential opportunities that enhance the value of this drug to a potential acquirer. And the last but not the least very important dimension is the defensive value. So if a particular acquirer uh, buys or invests in a particular drug, this prevents a competitor from doing the same and getting a leg up and sometimes this has a significant defensive value for existing drug portfolio or for R&D development portfolio. So those are the main, the main dimensions and they all have to be looked and uh, specific value opportunities have to be 
uh, search and identify and then credibly value and they have to be part of the, of the of the transaction discussion so we're coming now to the real options and uh, let me kind of quickly uh, basically uh, start with all of us are more familiar with financial options and I basically put here some information from a couple of days ago so the price of Pfizer a few days ago was 30 uh, to 80 and uh, a call option to buy the price for 3450 uh, it was worth 12 cents so uh, somebody had you know so not somebody but the market has decided that even though today Pfizer is significantly below 3450 there is a value worth 12 cents that there is a chance that the price will go above 2450 and somebody can exercise the option and and pocket the difference so what are the what are the key elements of optionality that are listed above the most important one is that options have value they're priced and they have a clear value so it's not a range it's not you know they have a single clear value even though there's a lot of uncertainty around them and they're bought and sold uh, the same analogy applies to optionality around real projects, not financial options. They also have value, and part of uh, uh, part of uh, you know a good valuation job is to actually uh, discover this value and credibly uh, and credibly introduce it. Uh, so the second is that option create a possible a possible opportunity to trade value. So there's no guarantee. You know, while the option is available. The Pfizer price may go low, 34 may not. So the option, as they say, may expire useless. So there's only a possibility to create value, but that's valuable itself. The next point is that to capture the value, if the possibility materializes, uh, requires executive action. It, it, it requires somebody to actually buy the option and make the investment with the so-called exercise price. Uh, so that's a key element of option. Uh, of option structure. So what do we call real options? Real options, the name comes from, not that they're kind of real versus fake, but the name comes from the idea that those are options on real assets rather than options on financial assets. And here, for example, the, you know, the so-called underlying, the opportunity is a potentially profitable projects, and you have the option to invest in these projects. So you have the, the, the potentially profitable project, which may turn profitable or not, you have the pro you have the opportunity to invest in the requirement to take executive action and to make the investment, and then finally you have the fact that this opportunity should be worth something and should be valued properly. So those are the the essence of the real options. So what is the real options analysis? Real options analysis is a valuation methodology that helps us to do three things: better evaluate project, optimally manage them, and correctly value them, and uh, better evaluate uh, is because it explicitly shows the different possible scenarios in which the project can develop unlike the simple MPV where we have a single scenario Patrick already talked a little bit about this the second thing is that uh, the success of highly risk project depends on a lot of decisions and the traditional MPV models do not incorporate decisions in the analysis they're basically a trajectory of cash flows so uh, real option analysis incorporates future decisions and also identifies their optimal execution. This will become clear later in the simple example that we will discuss. And finally, produces a single clear valuation, and this is quote unquote correct valuation because it satisfies a lot of requirements uh, in finance. One fundamental one being the so called non arbitrage. So, uh, two assets with the same cash flow should have the same price. Uh, because so many of you have literally heard so little about real options, the next few slides are a little bit kind of uh, credibility building. Uh, this is a famous uh, valuation book by McKinsey, uh, quite popular on valuation. And as you can see here, there's a chapter called Option Pricing, uh, Value and Flexibility, and a little bit self-serving. Uh, uh, truly yours is listed as, as the thought partner for this chapter. Uh, let me just stop here. Uh, Trying to move now to the next slide. Sorry, sorry, I'm not dwelling deliberately on this one. <laughs> We're trying. We're having a little bit of a technical problem. So here is uh, uh, the art of M&A. Uh, uh, again, uh, a chapter on real options. Uh, you can find the book. You can read another book on venture investing and financing innovation. Again, 
chapter of eruptions. Unfortunately, for most of those books, I call it the curse of the 200 page. So uh, very few of us read a book beyond page 200. And most of those chapters, unfortunately, are stuck far in the back. So uh, they're not very visible. Uh, and the final kind of slide here is uh, I've put a little collage of uh, publication that uh, talk about the use of real options specifically in pharma. And the reality is that some of the big and sophisticated companies uh, have been using this. And that's why the big opportunity lies with startups uh, to actually also benefit and leverage their position uh, in their negotiations. So as every, uh, as every other method, you know, it's a combination of, of benefit and difficulty. And here sort of, without dwelling uh, much, uh, basically, uh, uh, even though we already talked about the difficulty of multiples, but again, if you assume some dimensions of analogy, uh, you know, multiples are not that hard to construct. The problem with multiples is that, first of all, they're not transparent. And second, in a sense, you are implicitly assuming somebody else's valuation uh, as, uh, of, of something else is yours. And you know, if they have if they have committed an error, you are replicating the error. The NPV, uh, traditional, very important, tries to capture the future cash flow potential of, a, of of an asset. The problem is again, it it describes a single scenario which actually never happens. And from a mathematical perspective. In a sense, every cash flow in an MPV model is assumed to be certain. That's why so much attention is, is spent, and, and Patrick uh, to show a lot of the conventions around the discounting to incorporate the risk into the discount rate because the model itself does not do that. Then the Monte Carlo, the decision trees, again, are capturing uh, more detail, but then there's a problem with how this actually translated into value and finding the real option. So, uh, what I have put here is, given that those are key important dimensions, uh, very uh, relevant for a biotech investment, how the different methodologies stack against those metrics. And again, multiples, they don't show explicitly the uncertainty. They support only the initial decision, invest or don't invest. So you get a price based on the multiple. You either like it or you don't like it. Uh, then uh, they use analogy uh, to value uh, the NPV again, single scenario. They support the initial, only the initial decision, go, no, go. They do not value flexibility. Use a single cash flow stream uh, discounted at the WAC. Decision trees in Monte Carlo, multiple scenarios, multiple decisions, the problem with correctly discounting and valuing. And then real options, not surprisingly, as a guy who wrote a book on this, argues that the options puts this all together in a consistent way. Uh, again, absolutely true what Patrick said. At the end of the day, these the assumptions. If you have garbage in, whatever your model is, you're going to have garbage out. But this gives you the opportunity to build much more detailed and credible uh, set of assumptions. And we'll see this uh, in the coming example. So uh, when is real options very important? Well, very important when we have high uncertainty and high flexibility. Uh, why? Because MPV. Uh, and this, uh, this kind of cash flow uh, needs that. When it is also important, well, the real options are in addition to the so-called intrinsic value of the asset. So if the asset already has a very high intrinsic value, their options are sort of icing on the cake. But if the asset has a low initial MPV, real options become a uh, more important component of the overall valuation. And we'll see this later in the example. So now, um, I'm going to walk you through some very stylized, very simplistic uh, kind of example of biopharmaceutical investment. Uh, again, the periods are made standard. The numbers are very, you know, in, uh, not not taken from actual example. So this is all illustrative, and the point here is to convey the intuition of the approach. So we have uh, a, a traditional three phases of development, and then uh, after hopeful success and approval we can go straight to market or we can take an extra time and uh, complete a comparative test with a comparator which we assume already exists and then the outcome of this comparative test could be either po oh, sorry could be either positive uh, our product is better than than the comparator or could be negative you know we're maybe undistinguishable so this is the overall setting so the first thing that we do with a real option analysis and I forgot to mention this, that real options is not 
kind of a completely separate, uh, uh, you know, its own little stack. It actually uses all the other methods that I mentioned before. It uses MPV, it uses simulation, it, it uses uh, event trees, and just uh, the real option is just the final step, and you'll see this into it as we progress through the example and through the methodology. So the first thing is to identify and to represent the uncertainties in an open and credible way. Uh, just kind of going through a simple, through our simple example here, so if we go straight to market, we assume that we'll start selling 1,600 units and the uh, sales are going to grow just by 6% and we have some volatility of 20. If our comparative test is successful, we're going to sell more units, starts at 2,000 uh, with a 10% growth and a little bit low volatility. And then if we are unsuccessful with a comparator test or, or relatively indistinguished, we're going to start only with 1,200 and we have only 2% growth and 12% uh, uh, volatility. Also today, we assume that when we come to the market stage, our product is going to sell for $10 uh, per unit. But we understand that by the time we go through all the development stages, the time will elapse and the price may change because of economic developments, you know, uh, reimbursement changes or, or you know, uh, all this other stuff. So we're incorporating the market, the market uncertainty. So how do we measure, how do we model the, the uncertainty here, for example, is uh, the, the sales forecast at 10% growth if, if we are successful in our comparator test. And uh, dealing with the volatility, certainly we're showing, rather than a single line, we're showing a range of scenarios. And I uh, just want to kind of to comfort you, sometimes the ranges look quite white, but uh, this, there's a, a very uh, kind of sophisticated interplay of probabilities that actually keeps everything uh, sort of uh, together intact. So the averages, the way the probabilities work here is that the averages for each one of those periods equals our uh, assumed average 10% sales growth. Uh, similarly, for the, for the price, we assume that today the price is 10, but as we go through our development stage, by the time we go straight to market in year four, or if we go to market after a comparative test in year five, again, we're showing that there could be a range of uh, price developments uh, that, uh, that may unfold because of multiple uh, reasons. And again, we're doing these things only if behind that, we have a deep qualitative analysis that there are such scenarios that can justify this. If we believe that actually the reimbursement uh, process is pretty uh, safe and, and the population we're targeting is in such markets that uh, we don't expect significant changes, obviously this range may be narrow. So this is, this is all connecting to uh, basically giving us the opportunity to incorporate richer assumptions and to incorporate honestly dealing with the fact that today we do not know. So the second step is basically building the discount cash flow and the MPV model. Here we're using a very, very simple uh, free cash flow model. As you can see, basically it's price times quantity, so the revenue minus variable cost minus fixed cost. Uh, and then we combine price and volume, and we show this combination. And based on that, we develop an event tree, and we discount back the cash flows and the present value and we uh, develop the, uh, the intrinsic value of the, of the asset without flexibility, without optionality. So what we've done now, we have captured all the potential, initial and all the risk of the drug during its market stage. What's very important now is that we can take this understanding and now use it already in the risk development stage and incorporate this in our analysis and our decision making already in the risk development stage. So what I mean here, I'm showing two kind of extreme examples, but actually not that, uh, not that disconnected from reality. So in the development stage, if the economic scenario that unfolds is highly positive, so if we're learning that the targeted populations are growing, that the reimbursements are going to be higher, or whatever, the, whatever the driving, even if we have initial setbacks into actual R&D process, we may continue investing and, and you know, and uh, as you all know, change dosage, change targeted population, change uh, 
delivery change, a lot of things to quote unquote salvage the drug because the economic potential remains very high and very significant. And vice versa, uh, we may end up in a situation where we're successful in our investigation, we're passing the stages, but the economic scenarios they have developed uh, are proving uh, highly un 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 unfavorable. Let's say the targeted population may be shrinking, or suddenly the reimbursement is not there, uh, uh, whatever reasons, and then the question becomes, even though we're successful, uh, should we really, uh, you know, make the big investment in the next stage, especially when we come to stage three? If, uh, even if in the case that even if we're successful, we're going to be only just another me too drug, or we're going to be, uh, you know, a very rare disease drug, or whatever. So that's the that's the the power that this analysis provides, not only from an evaluation perspective, but really from understanding the uh, the possible ways in which this uh, drugs economics can evolve. And this is kind of the, the chart that captures this, in a sense, this is a very simple line with all the phases fail, succeed, fail, succeed, but what's also overlaid is the, uh, is the and I don't have a mouse to show actually something here, but it just uh, uh, basically captures what I already spoke about. So we can have a case, let's say the top red dot when we fail on phase two, basically saying we fail fails too, but the economics are extremely favorable. We're in the best possible economic scenario, big target population, big reimbursement, so maybe we should uh, try to do something different and uh, keep trying. Uh, vice versa, uh, when we're in the upper triangle, uh, the bottom green dots show that we're successfully passing to the next stage, but the economic scenario is the worst possible. So then kind of the question is, uh, does it justify further investing into uh, the drug? So, moving quickly to our example, the next step is in, uh, uh, identifying the optionality. And again, uh, it's called managerial flexibility because that's the intuition. Uh, the real option is basically uh, an action or available to management to take advantage of beneficial situation and create value. So, what are the fundamental decisions in our simple example? Of course, the first one is the MPV decision or the multiple decision. Go or no go? Do we start investing? Do we start a project or we don't? Then during the development stage, we have the decisions whether if we're successful uh, to move to the next stage or we're not successful whether to abandon uh, or to tweak as we discussed. And then once hopefully we get approval, we have a decision whether to do the comparator test or go straight to market. And as we saw in our inventory, all these decisions are pretty clearly defined in time. So they're in a specific time periods when we have to make them. Once we're in the market phase, uh, we have outlined here some very simple uh, options that are available to us over a longer period of time. So one of those we call it option to expand. So uh, this relates back to our strategic uh, strategic value of the project. So. If we're successful and the, and, and the drug is successful, do we have optionality to expand production and to new markets, for example? Uh, vice versa, very simple here, an option to contract. So if it turns out that, let's say, later side effects uh, require a narrow for use, uh, do we have an option to contract? And if we contract, uh, are there any savings from uh, redirecting the resources? And finally, do we have an option to abandon and basically stop the project if, for whatever reason, it turns out unprofitable and it's not uh, it's not reasonable to keep uh, going forward so those are very simple optionalities that we have outlined here just for illustrative purposes and we're coming now to the final uh, stage of basically doing the real option analysis and uh, and coming with evaluation and I remind you that one of the claims that we made in the beginning is that real options helps uh, kind of with better management of projects and what do we mean here is uh, this simple cone of scenarios captures the possible the possible evolution of the profitability of the drug. You know, it can do very well, it can do uh, badly, as, and as we discussed, we outlined these three simple options, expand, contract, or abandon. And uh, we perform something here that's called backward induction, it's, called, it's used in game theory, so we start at the end, and we look at each one end point, whether uh, at the given the situation, what is the optimal action? Should we perform, should we execute any one of those options or should we not? Should we just keep running the project with the capacity that we have planned in the beginning? 
And as you can see here, intuition uh, supports that if we're doing well, we expand. If we're doing badly, we abandon. And then we go a step back and we perform the same analysis. But now when we're saying, should I expand in this uh, point where it's shown to expand, we're saying, if I don't expand now, I have the option to expand. Uh, the optimal action would be to expand in the next period. So the analysis at every particular point capture it's called strategic optimality. It captures the optimality of actions all the way till the end of the project. Also, what is important at this moment is that these options interact with each other. So, for example, if we take away the option to expand, the analysis would show that the option to abandon becomes uh, more, um, you know, becomes optimal action a lot earlier than it shows now. So we get the integration, the interaction of optionality. And uh, now, finally, we're coming to the uh, final valuation effect. Uh, and uh, let me go to the next slide. So in our example, we're showing these three. Uh, so we're showing MPV uh, with uh, performing the comparative test. We're showing MPV without performing the And we're showing uh, uh, the MPV with the option value of this additional optionality. And as you can see in our example, this is 16%, which at the current valuation level, you know, 5%, uh, 10%, 16%, I think it's nothing to sneeze about. Uh, it's, it's quite a significant addition, if it can argue credibly. Uh, I, the other thing that I mentioned was, again, if the MPV is shrinking, and in our example, we've doubled the development cost to shrink the MPV. Uh, so we're showing now that the MPV went down, and now the option value became 23% of the final valuation. So. Uh, what what uh, kind of just to close the circle here is uh, during negotiation, the most important thing for both sides is to understand the full value potential of the asset, all possible sources of value. And actually, this is important not only to price it properly, but then when acquired, to actually follow up on all this potential of which specific action and capture it. And the second thing is that. Uh, you have to incorporate this with the reality of high uncertainty typical for the biotech. So the real option does both things. It helps with the full value and helps with getting the real risk profile of, of the asset. And this helps the buyer with assessing its risk appetite. It helps the buyer, uh, as we all know, that the way uh, companies make this decision is the champion of the deal actually has to make the case in front of senior management so it can this can help the champion to argue that this is really a good investment and that uh, that's what, uh, uh, you know, that the funding should be provided. On the seller side, the case is more obvious. You know, it would help investors in startups and management in startup when they engage in transactions for strategic sale or licensing uh, to actually make a stronger argument to their potential partner why the valuation should be uh, uh, higher and why should incorporate all these elements of value. So uh, that's kind of uh, the end of my little presentation. Excellent. Um, so we, we actually do have two questions. I know it's 11 o'clock at night in Singapore um, right now, uh, but let's just take these two questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, one is from Arthur. Uh, he was asking, within pharma, um, he hears a lot about Monte Carlo being used. How much are real options used by the buy side in license negotiations and you know, pitching um, their side of the. Well, uh, you know, the first the first claim of using real options by big pharma is by the CFO of Merck. Uh, I'm trying to remember her name uh, from 20 years ago. We can find Harvard Business Review in 1994, and she talks uh, capital value, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, and some of the articles that I uh, put in the collage shows, uh, so basically uh, big companies are using some form of real options. On the transaction side, it's not so, not so clear on the, uh, when, on the seller side, sorry, when, when uh, startups are advised by, by transaction advisors, how much. And, are the and I think that's the opportunity here to actually use it more, and I'd argue that it should be used more. Of course, the barrier to entry is uh, uh, there's more complexity. It's, it's more complex than uh, MPV, but like every uh, improvement, uh, you know, we have to learn. So, uh, on average, are the valuations, like in this example, are they coming out more positive? Well, uh, I, 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 actually, I actually want to make a very important point here. 
some people uh, see real options kind of as, as a value pumping device. And I think that actually it's very important to, to, to talk about true value and full value. Why? Because if you're on the buyer side and you have performed uh, this real option analysis, and let's say, just for example, you know, you've come to the value of 50, but the other side still existed, you have to pay 70. Then actually you have a stronger argument to walk away from the deal, which is the, the most important thing to do, to say, look, I've looked at every possible source of value, and given the certainty, uh, sorry, I should be looking, given the certainty, I do not see the price that you guys are asking. So for me, this deal would be value destructive. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, the other question was, I guess it's more directed towards Patrick, actually. Um, it comes from Mary. Um, if, if you could just go over quickly the other ways that you would increase the probability of success when you're doing this analysis, like when you get from you know our paper or or elsewhere that phase one drug should be at 66 percent probability to move on to phase two, at what point? What are the examples you might use where you bump that up to 75, 80 percent? Um, you want to respond to that one? Uh, yes. Uh, so, it, for example, if a drug is in phase one and um, we look at the drug, uh, it might have has been used in, in another indication in humans before. So um, you have some indication that it's it's not toxic. Um, you know, so that it, it gives you an indication it's not your standard um, average um, uh, phase one uh, risk, but you have some some indication why this risk would be lower. So that would be, for, for example, if, if there has been another trial done in the past, um, or the drug has been used in, in an somewhere else. Sometimes uh, drugs are being used without, um, uh, uh, you know, without uh, clinical trials or the different, the different scenarios why we would use that. So um, you, you, you really have to look specifically at the drug and, and at the circumstances. Okay, great. Um, I think we're, we're out of time here. So if you go to the next slide, just want to finish off thanking our, our panelists. Um, that was excellent. Um, we are going to be putting this on YouTube at some point. Um, and just give one last uh, reference here to the upcoming conference. We have 150 companies. Um, that's February 9th and 10th. And I will be also presenting there on a venture, um, venture capital report that we're putting out. Uh, we have a panel on the topic about five VCs on, on the 10th at the lunchtime session. Um, and we also want to mention, uh, if, you do, if you cannot make it to that, uh, we also have a bio convention uh, coming up in June in Philadelphia. That's June 15th through the 18th. So thank you for your time. Thank you for joining. I hope this was useful. Uh, hopefully most people uh, learned at least you know, one or two things. And uh, we can email the recording to you um, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.